speaker, King Crosby, and she is the daughter of the Diaspora Arawak West African Indian and Dutch, hailing from Trinidad and living currently in Toronto. She is a five-time award-winning multidisciplinary artist, organizer, and social entrepreneur. So a round of applause for <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna maybe just sit here. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Hi, y'all. Um, so I am, apart from all the other stuff that I do, I'm a queer black woman. And um, the film resonates for me on so many levels for so many different reasons. I also live between Toronto and Brooklyn, and so like being able to see Brooklyn in film is always a really, really nice thing. But um, one of the things I really appreciate about the film so deeply is the ways in which not only does it nuance queerness, but also blackness in ways that we don't often get to see represented in major motion pictures. And also that it had, the film itself is a collaborative effort from a lot of people in queer black community in Brooklyn, in Atlanta, um, all over the place. It was really like a labor of a lot of people investing into creating this most necessary space. So it's so beautiful to like, I've, I've been really lucky enough to watch it maybe a good eight or nine times and <laughs> see the director. <laughs> and have gotten to you know, meet the director and have gotten to hear um, like Kim Wayans and the other cast members talk about uh, their experience in the film and, and what it has looked like for them. So it just, I have a, like a personal, just like big crush on the film in general. So I love being able to watch with other people and hear other people's perspectives. Um, so I'm just really curious about for, for people watching this for the first time, um, what was something, what, what resonated for you? How did you feel like, I totally understand what that feels like, that absolutely is a lived experience I've had or I know what it has felt like to be in that particular situation. Because I feel like what's unique about it is that it is a really full story. It is a coming of age story. It is a story of you know, how we negotiate our parents. It is a story of how we figure out what we do after high school. It's a story of many different things layered in the reality of what it means to be queer and black. So. What were some things that people felt when they watched it? Curious. <laughs> um, the part when she, after the whole, um, I guess, interaction with her parents, they were fighting, she came out, and then she was lying on her um, her friend's lap, mm -hmm. and she's just crying, like just, you know, in, in, that part, in her partner's arms. Um, I can say that I really, really related to it just because like she came out and maybe she was crying, but it was more like like a deep breath. Mm -hmm. You can see, so it was really like liberating to mm -hmm. to come out and kind of be yourself and like just call into your person's arms and to be the person that you, you really want the world to see who you are. Mm -hmm. So it was so beautiful to see that part. That part really, really got to me mm -hmm. most. And I feel like it was a theme that kept building on with the, the poem around metamorphosis and the butterfly and what it means when you feel like you're just about to reach that point of transformation but it also feels like death right like right when you get to that place where everything is about to change everything that you have defined yourself in relation to is about to break and in that breaking is that freeing is that opening place that you were talking about That's, yeah what are maybe other things that people felt or resonated with yeah um, I thought it was like again uh, down to that metamorphosis thing uh, just because they did depict it on several layers and I know um, after she feels used after she feels like you know her body's been betrayed she sort of goes in her room and she does that exactly like, she does exactly what she says she's doing she uh, she exposes herself but within the safe space she makes uh, she almost makes it like uh, out to be a cocoon uh, mm -hmm. uh, but then there's light that comes in and I mean ultimately that's like a really shallow reading but at the same time I think that um there were a couple like really Eastern sort of themes in terms of like the the incorporation of the Om, the incorporation of um, this notion of rebirth and like of uh, wearing different skins, the dildo that's mismatched and the uh, the reappropriation of uh, something that's culturally it doesn't belong in uh, the most technical sense where it was on that girl's shoulder and yet she sort of maps it out, she sort of uh, rediscovers this. It's um, the different, like it's almost the differences we see in our bodies, the changes that we uh, we inflict upon ourselves as opposed to simply uh, conventional choice, right? Definitely. I, think that, I, I don't think it's a superficial reading at all to say that those things are, I feel like everyone else in the room is like, superficial? I didn't even realize that. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> so I think that, that all of those things are, are, are really, really true. Actually, the, the director, um, D. Reese, wrote the poetry that was in the film, that punctuated the film. You know, mm -hmm. So it was very intentional in terms of the ways that she was really trying to continue to bring up um, the way that rebirth happens and the ways that we live many different lives. And I think that there is, that there are our chapters and passages in our lives and then huge shifts that happen that take us to entirely different places to the point where it feels like a complete other reality, which I think is also something that came up. Anything else? Well, that's sort of what I ask. I mean, like, do, what do you guys think of the mom? Because, I mean, I found myself, it's so difficult because that's a character that's much true to real life, mm -hmm. just because you are so conflicted and both embracing her because she's got a lot of trauma and there's some sort of like subplot that's going on between her and the husband at the same time she's she's a villain in so many respects and she's doing the wrongs that that are essentially driving the plot in the story that are uh, that are killing uh alika alika right I really love the portrayal of the mother, but sorry. Yeah, I think it's a really natural response when your life is falling apart, you know, she just wants to control it and keep everything mm -hmm. together and she can't. Yeah. And everything's falling apart and she can't let it. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And I, I was actually thinking about the scene in the bathroom, in the washroom when she's changing her clothes, and I really thought that was kind of a universal image in a way, like so many youth, right, they're going to take off makeup or change the clothes, whatever it is, mm -hmm. right, that transformation, that double life that they're living, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. and just that idea of not being, not being heard and just not being able to be who you are, but that really, that washroom scene really, really just reminded me of, you know, school days. Right? Yeah. All those things are really true because I think that um, one of the reasons why I really like this film is because I feel like the mother is afforded a nuanced portrayal when so often it's so easy to demonize uh, anyone who is homophobic, you know, and particularly the way that blackness gets de de demonized as being homophobic. Like all Jamaicans are homophobic and all of the black community <laughs> hates gay people. And, you know, that's a really erasing experience, one, as a black gay woman, right? Because you're like, I exist. <laughs> and there's lots of people who support that process all the time. Um, and I think also, you know, it, very much so, that it's a complicated reality to think about the ways in which religion has been a part of someone's life and has sustained them up until a certain point and has taken care of them and has absolutely guided their actions, has been the framework by which they understand the world, and then you come up against the reality of your child who is expressing this, under, this, this experience of the world that absolutely counters everything you know to be true, right? And what does it mean when you're trying to still make sense of the world in the context of that framework when it doesn't actually work with the reality that you live in? And I think that that's kind of you know, one of the failings in general of, of, of the ways in which organized religion manifests itself, is that it is up to cultural interpretations. And it does happen in very different ways in different places. And it doesn't always happen in accordance to like the way that the, the books were written or the ways that those things were intended. But the ways in which those things play out can be really, really violent. Um, and when Kim Wayans, uh, at, the, at one of the viewings I saw, when she talked about it, she said, you know, I really wanted people to understand that this woman was complicated, that she did love her daughter so deep, deeply. And I love the part of the, where the father draws attention to the fact that, you know, when she was a little girl, you know, her mother always picked her up and that she always wanted to protect her. Or even just a response at the final exchange where she was saying, you know, I really hope you're keeping safe. Like for her, it is around safety. When I did come out to my mother, that was the, her primary concern. That you are a black woman and you're gonna be gay out loud, like openly for everyone. Like what kind of reality are you going to be stepping into recognizing the ways in which the world will treat you, right? So there is, a, it is grounded in a complete sensical understanding of the world that your life will be less safe when you are a black gay woman. That's just true, that's absolutely a true reality and that's something that she's coming to terms with and doesn't have the language or the support or the context or the, she doesn't have anyone, right? Like this is someone who, she's, we were watching as her husband is having another relationship and we're watching as her children are growing up and changing and she's literally inhabiting the private domain of the house by herself that this space that's large is literally closing in on her and it constitutes all of her reality. And I think what you said is so true that, you know, as you start to lose all of these things that mean something to you, then you seek to deeply control whatever you can find and whatever that looks like. Um, and so I think that it is, it's complicated. It's definitely complicated. And I think um, every, every person who I've known has had that coming out process has to negotiate 
how you love your parents when there's this big part of you that your parents can't love? Or how can you reconcile the love that you've had with your parents and shared with your parents um, when it changes and when that manifestation of it changes? I think that that's such a difficult... I don't think that there's, I don't think that there's a, a place to reconcile it. I don't think there's a place to say that the mother is right or wrong or that the daughter is right or wrong, but that it is literally that breaking open. That at some point, something has to shatter, that there is a critical mass that we reach and then things have to shift. <laughs> but how did we feel about Alike as a character? How did people like her or identify with her or not identify with her? Mm -hmm. I just, I thought she was like, just such a great, great main character. Um, especially, well, one of the most hard-hitting lines in the entire film for me is when Vina says, I'm not like gay gay. Mm -hmm. And this is my second time seeing it, but the first time it felt like a slap in the face. Just yeah. cause like, mm -hmm. I feel like for Alike hearing that, it just like isolated her even more because here is this person she thought she could connect with mm -hmm. and was like maybe gonna have a relationship with and that's so validating. Mm -hmm. And then like, just to feel that isolation again, it just like reminded me of being like gay in high school and like the isolation of that. And I'm like, whoa, like I've been in that scenario. I know how that feels. And I thought like the actress as well did such a great job of that scene. It was just like, oh, uh, so great. Anybody else? Anybody gay as a character? Yeah, I think that that's her sexuality is and how it means and how she needs to pre present that like mm -hmm. I kind of like the first scene when she's in the club and she's kind of doing it with her friend and that's kind of like her how she's been exposed to like uh, feminine masculinity in female masculinity in the, in the black community and so she's like this is how I have like I feel like she almost feels like that's how I have to be mm -hmm. and then you know then she like exits that space and then she has to like put on a different face for her family that's more feminine and I kind of like seeing how in the end I felt like she she didn't completely end up with like she found like a new I guess kind of like an entity that suited her a little bit better than maybe the one of the club or the one of her family or whatever. I think it's um it's again such an interesting process of like what does it mean to what's the best way to describe this. I play a game, I work with uh, young people, queer and trans youth, mostly of color, and we have this game that we play called North of Bloor. And the way that it works is that we have like a pillar or some sort of demarcation in the middle of the room, and walking up to that pillar, they'll walk the way they walk and like be the way they are in the downtown core. So they'll be however they are, however they're most comfortable walking through the world in the downtown core, and then the pillar represents North of Bloor. And so it represents the place for them where their whole identity and their whole way of being in the world shifts. So, you know, queer boys who are wearing really, really tight pants and who are walking in a particular way or expressing themselves in a particular way, when they hit that pillar, there's a certain kind of like way that they man up. And they have to perform masculinity in a whole other different way. Or queer women, there's certain things you have to take off and certain things you have to put on in order to recognize that you're crossing a boundary in the city where the ways in which your body is going to be read is going to be very, very different. And you know, we play this game and it's kind of a funny thing, like we, it's like silly, like you're doing this one persona up until you hit that place and then you do this whole other persona, but it, you know, what it really represents is the many different ways we have to code switch, right? And I think everyone has a different way that they code switch, whether you know, you're from a low income, cash poor community and there's a particular kind of language you speak, and then you come into academia and you gotta speak in a whole different way, or whether you know you have an accent, and then there's a whole other kind of different language that you've got to talk with certain groups of people. Like there are many different ways that we code switch, and I want us to think about how it isn't a lie, the people that we have to be in these different places, but rather it is a necessity of the conditions that are created, the people that we need to walk into, or the bodies we need to walk into. That for a really long time, I felt like I was lying to people. You know, when I was when I was like gay gay me, and then like medium gay me, and then like gay light. Um, but I realized that there are just very different contexts that we have to navigate, and that actually isn't my fault. It isn't my fault. The creation of a world that isn't safe for me, I didn't do that. And so my need to navigate different spaces with different ways and different language and different dress, it doesn't make me any less legitimate of a person, but rather it just it speaks to how vastly different these worlds we have to walk in. And that literally, this north of Bloor, one spot 
can literally change so deeply how you need to move through the world. I really loved the ways that they showed that, that she, you know, there's a different, there are different communities that we access different parts of ourselves. And we want all of them, right? Sometimes we can't give up any of them, we need all of them. What about like in general, the process of, of it as being a coming out story? I don't know, for people who don't identify as queer, how did it feel to watch that, to watch someone coming into that and talking about it and learning about it? Or for people who are queer. I really like her relationship with her friend. Uh, don't remember her name. And just seeing the chosen family that we have to have as queer people. Mm -hmm. And what your family shuns you, whatever. Um, and how she modeled her uh, version of masculinity, or what it was to be, what what it is to be a queer woman against her friends. And then as she got more comfortable with herself and her queerness, she kind of shifted and came into herself. Mm -hmm. I love, I love the last friend. Oh my gosh. Go ahead. I have to say I really enjoyed the aspect of the butch on butch uh, friendship, the exploration of like uh, that dynamic, which is very rarely seen in movies, uh, where the, the idea is that when you're coming out, you're coming out like in this like generic type of like gay identity. Whereas she has a really specific like identity as a stud or mm -hmm. or butcher or however like she, but that's that's not like femme identified mm -hmm. so that 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 lends like a, uh, a particular way of seeing it but often it's not necessarily shown right which is a really important part of like coming out into a queer community as somebody that's butch identified or not femme identified mm -hmm. or whatever that kind of like easing into the community that, that happens not necessarily just by yourself, but by developing those friendships with other people mm -hmm. that can kind of like direct you and how you're supposed to act and mm -hmm. how you're supposed to get a girlfriend or stuff like that, mm -hmm. right? So that was a really, really, it was really nuanced. I really enjoyed seeing their interaction mm -hmm. and the love there. It's a pretty special thing, and I like I love like when we talk about what it means to have chosen family, um, the ways we get raised in community. Like I left home when I was 15, so the people who raised me were like 16, 17. You know, like those are the people who are absolutely teaching me about what it meant to be queer, or what it meant to like occupy space or not occupy space, or taught me about what gender looks like or doesn't look like. And I think that um, it's such a very I think the best friend. I'm not, again, the name escapes me too, which is sad. Um, but the way that she was coming up her relationship with her mother and her relationship to her community as someone who's probably been out for you know a while and probably out of necessity and also probably without that choice of being able to come out when she wanted to on whatever terms she wanted to um, and watching her pass on whatever knowledge she has access to right and that's all we do you know we pass on what we know and we can't really take people past that point right you can only take people to that exact to that exact place um, but I do think it's really significant. Again, yeah, like watching, I think it's beautiful, the many different relationships that got developed in this film. So often, so often in all films, you only get to see one primary dynamic and it is usually like the central like hetero relationship that is the fixture of whatever movie it is. And it was amazing to see like, that the nuanced relationship between female masculinity, the relationship between her and her father, like that relationship was really distinct and really beautiful. He loved her so much and that was so complicated how he was trying to negotiate his relationship with his wife and clearly his other lover. Like there are many different, I felt like I could have feelings about each person, which is really nice because so often it is that there's someone who's a villain, there's someone who's a good guy and there's someone who is dismissive and just an extra character, you don't know anything about them but you actually got to get the fullness of, of people's motivations um, in most cases. Do you, were there any characters that you felt like you wished that you knew more about or you felt like it was lacking, like you felt like there was pieces you wanted to understand more about their motivations? I would have liked to see more of the sibling relationship, um, mm -hmm. Alicia and her sister, and I don't know, I kind of wish that this is, I think that the last scene that we saw her and her sister with in, in the bed together, it seemed like her sister was supportive of her, but we didn't see enough of that right until that last moment, and it um, seemed like her sister should be somebody who's more supportive of her, and I don't think that she was in a lot of instances, like, you know, I'll tell about everything about this. And, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, I'd like to see more of Bina, personally, especially, like, her take on her sexuality, because it seemed like she was really struggling with that mm -hmm. as well, and, yeah, I just, like, I would watch an entire another movie just about her, so. <laughs> <laughs>
I was gonna say I also liked it would have been nice to, like I, I know they include it but like the best friend Laura I think and her sister's relationship and the way that they support mm-hmm. each other and they have been isolated from their mother and stuff. I thought that was interesting. It would have been kind of and like obviously in this movie you can't like do everything but yeah. it would have been nice to build up the sibling relationships by seeing both of them. Mm-hmm. I think um, we don't always have to fill in all the blanks, right? I think we have to leave room for the imagination. And I think her best friend's mom, I think that was just, you could just see a lot, you just felt the power exuded from this woman standing in the doorway. And you kind of get the whole narrative, boom, right there, right? So sometimes you don't always have to um, um, get the whole background story, right? So, yeah. I think that's such a good point, and Kimmy talks about this too, of like, there's a particular kind of pressure that's put on films that speak to a very, for a subculture, that people have this expectation and this hope and this desire, and they place all of it that they want the film to be everything, right? They're like, I want you to give the best, most nuanced portrayal of everyone who has ever been queer or black <laughs> ever, and all of the family members. And you know, we have to we have to be responsible for that as audiences members, right? The ways that we want that. And it what 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 we're really struggling with is the absence of these narratives. That we're what we're trying to say actually is we want more, give us more. And we're not trying to say make this film everything for everyone. So I think that there's like that balance of what it means to that we don't, that most of the films and I have this conversation all the time that, you know, I'm so finished seeing like the eighth period piece about Queen Elizabeth, right? Like I'm 100 percent done with that. Like I would I want to see why couldn't Harry Potter have been like an Argentinian lead? You know, why can't we have movies that are set in Tibet in like contemporary in 2012? You know what I mean? Like why do we always get to see the same stories of whiteness? Recycled constantly over and over and over and over again in films when there are so many there's like this room alone You know like this room each person in this room I have never been able to see represented in a film right and I would love to actually see those kinds of stories like the, the great nuance and depth of the multitude of stories have the capacity to be shown and like that would be when we think of like queer black canon of films you know there's like a good Six, <laughs> I want to say, you know, there's like maybe a good six, and I think that and other other directors that I know of as well, you know, they struggle with that. They struggle with putting out new films into that canon, knowing that people are so critical because there really is only four, and they're really watching all of those four <laughs> so carefully with everything and all of their hopes and dreams on it. So I think, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right that like we can we can want more and desire more, but it has to be from that place of hunger and not of like a. I need you to be everything in all of this film for me. Were there things that people learned for the first time? Things that they did not know about before, did not think about before? Well, back to what you just said, I think it's kind of interesting just because um, I think like the mark of a really good character is one where everybody in the room was sort of able to connect with that one character. Like, I mean, I know when I was watching that, there were so many things like, I don't know what it's uh, what it's like to be black and queer, but at the same time, watching that, there are so many scenes. I mean, the one that I think resonated with a lot of people, a lot of people in this region right here, especially, mm-hmm. but uh, the one where uh, her mother hits her, right? Mm-hmm. And I mean, you get like scenes like that where it's just like it's a packaged, well delivered, like it's a cinematic version of an emotion. So it's mm-hmm. acutely sensitive. And the thing is, when you have a character like that, where numerous people, countless people, regardless of wh- what you are, could uh, inflate the character with your own being, then clearly you've left enough gaps for me to fill it in. It's like ad-libbing it, and I think that's the mark of a good character. And so you start to learn things because you're almost watching yourself by heresy. You're almost watching yourself from a third person uh, perspective. When I was watching that uh, scene where she gets thrown against the the wall, uh, essentially, I don't know, it was um, like, it was something that I've been through and I've lived. And so seeing that in particular certainly did resonate with me, but I got to, I got to appreciate it. I, I really got to understand not only where I was at that time, but what was happening to me and why it mattered. You know what I mean? There's a lot of things that we don't evaluate, and there's a lot of things we tend to overlook. There's a lot of things where 
uh, just like the mother sort of just smiles through her dinner and talks about how she got it out of a magazine we'll do that to ourselves but ultimately when you see it in context when you see yourself in another person's body you're able to uh you're almost able to knit your emotions into this far larger patchwork this far la larger fabric that includes everybody in the scene mm -hmm. so i don't know i thought that was beautiful yeah um, i i um, i work on i work as an assistant director on a few documentaries and one of the and i also teach um art and like art and activism stuff but one of the things I always say to my students is that you know it's in the specifics that things become universal mm -hmm. it's actually when you go like that hard that deep into the very specific nuances of someone's experience it's then actually that it becomes this experience that people are all able to be like yes that totally is me that's absolutely me I might not get that but because you had me there I'm totally with you all the way through here you know and I think that um, again we are it is expected that we're supposed to identify with like white men playing any character, you know, like we can watch white men be lawyers or red horses or whatever, like that's supposed to be okay that we're, like that's a neutral experience that we're all supposed to be able to watch and be like, yeah, it's totally like that for me. Um, but that, you know, and I, I think that Hollywood and doesn't believe that the audience will be able to do that, that we'll be able to watch a story about a queer black kid in Brooklyn and be able to have that universality of experience, that from the specifics, without trying to gloss it over, without trying to make it prettier than it is, without trying to make it messier than it is, making it exactly what it is, that people from that place can be like, right, yeah, that, all of those things, and some of those things resonate, and some of them don't, but I'm still really present, I'm still really engaged in that. You were gonna? she's in the yellow sweater and she gets out of the car and then there's the two men leaning against the wall yeah it's the gaze the stares and the whispers how something so invisible uh, within her is somehow visible through their words through their perception it's made visible mm -hmm. uh, her queer identity and it's their interpretation and there's recognition of her as different uh, that makes it visible and conscious to her. And I think that's something that um, myself as a woman uh, of color um, encounters quite often too. Uh, others interpretations of yourself and how you should be according to their ideas and norms. Right. And it doesn't really reflect at all. And somehow it's like perverse. Definitely. I think, um, I think that often we are told to distrust things like our intuition or our capacity to read body language, right? Like we're taught that unless someone is communicating something explicitly that's homophobic or racist or sexist or ableist, mm -hmm. that it's not actually happening, but that we can feel that in the gaze, that we didn't need him to say anything in that moment to know the ways that he was looking at her, to understand the kind of messages that were being communicated, or as you were saying with the mother, you know, walking up, she didn't need to say a damn thing. I was very clear on like all the feelings she was having, you know, like those things are real, and that th those kinds of microaggressions, as, as people of color, as women, as people who experience that judgment of their normativity, those things are so hard to touch and to talk about with other people, to be like, I went to the grocery store and people just looked at me and it was just bad. I don't want to tell you about how it was just bad, but it was just really, really bad. Like there's not, and people are like, are you sure? Well, maybe they were just, and you're like, no, I'm sure. Like we're sure, right? And I think that that's one of the things for me definitely that is really great about this film is that one of the, I, was, I watched it with my mom actually, and you know that was one of the things I was trying to explain to her, that it's not just the way that people say things to me, it's the way that people look at me, and from their look, I know that I'm wrong. Like, I know that I'm wrong. I know that I'm doing a bad job. Of, I'm, I'm a failed project of womanhood. I'm doing awful at it, right? And I think that that's also, you know, uh, one of the experiences of being queer, that you are failing at that gender that you're supposed to be, that everyone is supposed to be really coalescing around and like that experience of normativity. Like what does it mean to have your literal, everything that your body is defined at, as just to be not the norm, to be that failure, right? And like how does it, and I think that one, one of the things that's so beautiful in the way that she comes to terms with that at the end is that it is a breaking open, you know? That that doesn't make it any less 
hard or painful or violent, but that it is a breaking, that you are not normal, and that we are not going to fit into that invented standard of normativity. And there is a freedom in not having to, what we were describing, like the feeling of, you know, when she was laying in her friend's lap, that there's like that exhale, mm -hmm. that like, shit is real. <laughs> it's really real, but it's also that feeling of like, I don't have to, I don't have to pretend anymore, because everybody knows, you know, everyone has that feeling. Mm. Yeah. Um, on the topic of the mother, I think that was a character I would have really liked to have uh, learned more about. Um, and I say this, I guess, as a non-black straight person that um, I had a really tough time, I guess, being really sympathetic towards the mother, being really understanding. Um, and it was really interesting the point you made about how the mom always wanted to ensure their daughter was safe. But I think for sure, I think it was a moment where when she threw the daughter against the wall and like punched her, like. I think there's some inconsistency, and I'm pretty sure she realized it. She probably fucked up. She probably realized that, I assume. And I guess, as you said, too, the, the, the example of um, uh, when she was two years old and the mom always being the one to pick her up and leaves, I think that makes her a bit more sympathetic. But I think being fully sympathetic and understanding towards the mother, it's something that I, I'm not there. I'm not a very understanding person. So I would have loved to uh, know more about the mother to, I guess, better understand her, perhaps more sympathetic. Yeah, I think that um, I think sympathy doesn't require reconciliation, right? We don't have to forgive her to understand her, and I think that that's really a big part of what um, it means to come to terms with like a parent who has that kind of feeling about you. That you might not ever forgive her for the things that you did, but that doesn't mean that you can't understand the context. And I do also think, um, and this is something I can speak for from my experience as a queer woman of color, but there's this particular. Um, construction of parents as being infallible, right? That like parents are never wrong. And even when they're wrong, like 100% wrong, that they won't apologize or say that they're wrong because the entire power structure of parents is about not ever being wrong, right? And so I do think that there's this place that like, what is that? I, and my mom always said, would say this to me, you know, when I, when I first became a parent, there was no handbook. I didn't really know what I was doing. I pretty much knew I was fucking up all the time. <laughs> and I was doing a really bad job of raising you. And I, um, she always has this story where she's like, I walked into your, your room one day and you were just this like tiny, alive thing. And I had no idea what to do with you. And I was just freaked out. And I called your grandmother and I was like, I don't know, but I missed something. Like I, everyone said that I was just going to give birth and it was going to make sense and I was going to know what to do. You know, and I think that this is a woman who doesn't necessarily know how to manage her own life. Right? And she's not, she's trying to raise two kids and negotiate the, the end of her marriage, but also possibly the continuation of her marriage, um, and trying to protect her daughter um, with bad blueprints, right? Like, the blueprints that religion gives you for dealing with queer kids are bad. <laughs> bad. <laughs> They're not really helpful. It doesn't give you a lot of really, really great context, even though many different religious scholars have interpreted um, all sorts of religious texts in ways that are supportive. That's not necessarily what people are fed and not what, what people are supported with. So I do think that, you know, we don't have to forgive her. We don't have to say, like, it was okay that you hit her because you had a lot of feelings. Like, I don't think we ever need to do that. I think that it's always important to be, like, you're accountable for your actions. And your actions happen in a broader context and in a broader world that is entirely homophobic, right? Like New York is a homophobic place, as is the United States of America. And whether that homophobia takes place in the systemic violence of not being able to allow people to get married, not being able to allow people to have access to like insurance and support and visit their families, or it's the direct frontline violence of the ways that families and communities police gender, that's all violence. Everyone's accountable, and we're all accountable for the ways that we contribute to that structure. Um, and different people have different kinds of responsibilities based on where their social locations lie. Right? Yeah. I don't know if you, but give a round of applause to congratulate.